Greetings, friends in Christ. It is Thursday, January 21st, my birthday today. And a little angel came to see me this week and brought me a little present. And I'm going to play it for you right here. <laughs> Ready? coming it says I'm going to put this in all my Christmas gear and next year when we have all the church parties people will get to see it again so thank you to Emily and Aiden and Amber and Jameson for this beautiful gift and uh, I will cherish it always and think of you uh, and so since it was a little festive today I thought I would you know fire up my cycle and uh, also read you from Psalm 113 before we hear a little more about the service of worship. We're now to the prayer for illumination. Alleluia! You who serve God, praise God. Just to speak God's name is praise. Just to remember God is a blessing now and tomorrow and always, from east to west, from dawn to dusk, Keep lifting all your praises to God. God is higher than anything and anyone, outshining everything you can see in the skies. Who can compare with God, our God, so majestically enthroned? Surveying God's magnificent heavens and earth, God picks up the poor from out of the dirt, rescues the wretched who've been thrown out with the trash, seats them among the honored guests, a place of honor among the brightest and best. God gives childless couples a family, gives them joy as the parents of children. Alleluia. Amen. So we're going to continue now in uh, The Worshiping Life by Lisa Nichols Hickman, and we're going to talk about the prayer for illumination. She starts with a, a poem by Jane Kenyon called Things. The hen flings a single pebble aside with her yellow reptilian foot. Never in eternity the same sound, a small stone falling on a red leaf. The juncture of twig and branch, scarred with lichen, is a gate we might enter, singing. Things simply lasting, then failing to last, water, a blue heron's eye, and the light passing between them, into light all things must fall, glad at last to have fallen. A poet's day is a constant prayer for illumination, observing daily life incessantly, taking note of the small details that illumine and inspire. Some days are dark, some days are dull, some days no poems call out. Then, when a hen flings a single pebble, pebble, the recognition that this sound will never again be repeated inspires a poem. The poet knows the arduous task of waiting and looking thousands of days and ways for that cast of light passing to illumine the blue heron, the twig and the branch, the yellow reptilian foot. Poet Naomi Shihab Nye calls these moments of illumination the gleam of particulars. We look for the gleam of particulars in this world God created because we cannot manufacture that gleam of light ourselves. We like to think we can. With the advent of industrial light, with the turning of the clock for daylight savings time, with the glow of neon advertising things to claim our souls, we believe we can manufacture light and its powerful glow. The irony of this day and age is that there are so many things flashing at us. It makes finding true light an even more difficult task. James Terrell, 
a Quaker, is so angered by the overabundance of manufactured light in our culture that he has dedicated his career as an artist to getting his viewers to experience light in a new way. Inspired by the Quaker prayer spoken on the way to a gathering, go inside and greet the light. He invites his viewers to do the same as they enter a museum housing his creations. Rothko-like canvases apparent to the viewer's eyes are facades created by the cast of light. One of his works, an entire room, pitch black, is an invitation for the viewer to sit 20 minutes or more to achieve the effect of a glimmer of light that comes in the midst of the darkness. The weight in the dark makes the viewer uncomfortable. Sit in the dark with strangers? No, thank you. Devote 20 minutes of my lunch hour at the museum squeezed into an already too busy day to wait for the light to dawn? I'll walk on to the next exhibit. We don't have the patience to look for illumination that brightens not by the glow of a lamp, but by the effort of truly looking to see. If we don't have the 20 minutes of patience needed to see this light in a museum exhibit, how then can we sit through scripture and a sermon and wait for illumination? Thorny texts, dry preaching, a baby's cry. We don't have the patience or desire to sit and wait. With a dark world at our fingertips, we want the flick of a switch to make it brighter. Who can wait for someone to ignite a real fire? In the desert, there is a plant that blooms fiery sparks of red. This fire occurs at the tips of one of the most lifeless plants in the desert, the ocotillo. Most of the year, the ocotillo looks hopeless, like a spray of sticks and thorns. Standing six feet tall or higher, the plant consists of 20, 10 to 20 long sticks gathered at its base, spread open at the ends of the branches. It doesn't even have the kittiness of a cactus or the personality of prickly pear. It looks dead, lifeless, and downright dismal most days of the year. Then the winter snowmelt brings just enough hydration and the spring sun brings just enough light to call the ocotillo out of death and into life. Slowly, small leaves creep up its branches and then ignite at the top into a fiery red glow of feathery flowers. These red flowers guide the hummingbirds on their spring trek north. Sometimes what we see in our lives or in the scripture texts for the day looks a lot like those sticks and thorns. On one, as one congregation member asked upon hearing the scripture one Sunday, I came to the church to hear this. We don't want to hear about the thorny side of judgment or the sticky texts of terror. The fire that ignites isn't the passion within us to hear and to serve, but the fiery anger of the truth of being known. So scared are we of hearing and knowing, we retreat. We aren't willing to put ourselves into the darkness of a scripture text because its shadows can at times be more apparent than its light. We don't have the patience to wait for the fiery flowers to bloom. The Guggenheim Museum in New York City offered a retrospective show of the paintings of Robert Rauschenberg. Known for their immense and colorful collages, one painting stood out as entirely different. It was one of those paintings that begs the complaint, I could have painted that. Yet its simplicity was deceptive. Painted entirely black, it had a single slice of light piercing the center of the canvas. The title of the painting didn't give much hint to its meaning, untitled. But then, an apparent afterthought, there in parentheses was another thought almost scribbled in, untitled, parentheses, night blooming, unparentheses, was the title in its entirety. Was the night blooming into further darkness overtaking the light? 
or was the night slowly blooming out and unfolding into light? This is the question the church faces each week as the pastor and congregation stand before the dark canvas of the world with a small sliver of illumination held between the covers of our Bible. We pray for illumination that the words of Scripture might unfold and bloom light into light, light out of darkness, dead sticks into fiery flowers so that all the world might witness the glory of God. Darkness will not have the last word. Night will not bloom even darker and deeper into night. Christ pierces the darkness. His life stands like a small sliver against the dark canvas of injustice, against the inability to accept God's grace revealed. Through, this, through his life, light overtakes the darkness. Recently, the Catholic Church realized it had not fully emphasized the light shed into the world by the life of Christ. Its rosary prayers consisted of the joyful mysteries of the Annunciation, the sorrowful mysteries of the Passion, and the glorious mysteries of the Resurrection. But what about his healing and teaching? What about the light cast at the table of the Eucharist and the glow of the Transfiguration? In an effort to illuminate even more fully the life of Christ, the church added the luminous mysteries of Christ's life, his baptism, the wedding at Cana, his proclamation in parables, the transfiguration, and the Eucharist. These luminous mysteries reveal another artist at work, painting streaks of light across the dark canvas of the world. We pray for illumination that we might see this hand at work. As I walk through the desert, my prayer, like the poet's, is to see something new, that some wildflower, creature, stone, or mountain might be illumined in a new light, in a new way. We don't just go inside to greet the light. We go outside to the everyday street corners to look for illumination. In the movie Smoke, the owner of a Brooklyn tobacco shop, Augie Wren, praise for illumination by taking a single photograph each day. You would think that the subject of the photograph would be different each day, but he takes a picture of the same street corner every day at the same time, 8 a.m. One day a customer notices the camera and asks about it. Augie pulls out his photograph album filled with 4,000 pictures of the same corner. The customer, seemingly surprised, shrugs, and Augie responds, that is my life's work. It's my corner, a record of my little spot in the world. But things happen here too. The customer begins flipping through the pictures quickly, and Augie retorts, slow down. You'll never get it unless you slow down, my friend. The customer does, but he still doesn't get, get it. They're all the same, he dismisses. Augie explains further, but each one is different. There is summer light and autumn light. Each day the light hits the earth at a different angle. Finally, as the customer looks closely at the pictures, he notices the change of lights and shadows, cars and passers-by that illumine this corner of the world. In the midst of a smoky tobacco shop, a too busy consumer is taught to pray for illumination, to see the light amidst the haze of life. Last year, the citizens of Tucson were thrilled to have the opportunity to greet the light as a meteor shower promised dazzle in the middle of the night. My decision whether to set my alarm for 3 a.m. to witness it became a spiritual struggle. I wanted to see the shower, but sleep was tempting. I succumbed to temptation and missed the meteor shower, which occurs less than once a century. The following Sunday, one pastor shared in sermon about setting the alarm and waking up his children. Setting their alarm clock became a prayer for illumination. The world is dark, but the night is blooming into light. Our challenge is to pray for the illumination that will help us to see it. Amen to that.
I was just visiting someone this week who said, you know, it's not the snow, it's not the um, lack of leaves on the tree that gets you here. It's the gray days. And sometimes we have a number of them in a row. And we have to look closely, don't we, to see the light around us. Like our author walking in the desert to see what changes might have occurred. Let's pray for this nation, for our community, for our families and friends as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, today, your prayer for illumination might be seeking some light in some places where maybe you just can't quite see it yet.